very good afternoon to all of you and greetings from Sri Lanka Medical Association. Welcome to the clinical meeting conducted in collaboration with Sri Lanka Medical Association and the College of uh, Ophthalmology. And uh, we'll be starting this clinical meeting in the conventional pattern with the case presentations and then moving into review and then followed up by the MCQs and the quizzes. First of all, I would like to invite Dr. Uchira Somavira, the senior registrar in ophthalmology, to start with her case presentation to uh, start the clinical meeting. Over to you, Dr. Uchira. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, here now uh, we are going to uh, discuss about the cases that are both uh, common to dermatology and ophthalmological fields. And uh, I'm Dr. Uchira Somavira. Dr. Uchira, sounds are not coming. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, cases that are both related to uh, ophthalmology and dermatology. And um, so uh, my first uh, present case is about a 62-year-old female who came to our uh, OPD with a lip, upper left-sided uh, facial pain and uh, for four days duration and which has progressed to involve it. The pain was um, extending up to the vertex and uh, the pain has progressed to involve uh, the um, left side of the face as then the, there was later she developed uh, edema bilateral and afterwards afterwards there were now this is the face of the patient and uh, then afterwards she had developed uh, blisters involving the upper uh, quadrant of the face left side and it was the lesion were <clears throat> respecting the midline they were as you can see here they are not uh, crossing the midline and uh, the uh, edema is involving not only the left side, it is in also involving the right side. And um, so uh, here, uh, the, there was no Hutchison sign. Hutchison sign is the sign where they, you get blisters over the tip of the nose and which, uh, which uh, gives, correlates with the uh, ocular involvement as well. And uh, now here, the vision was relatively okay. It was 6 to 12 on both eyes. And uh, the conjunctivitis, she was having conjunctivitis, which was follicular. And uh, she was diagnosed of having herpes soster ophthalmicus. And uh, so a little bit about the herpes soster. So it can be due to direct viral invasion, which in case it can cause conjunctivitis and epithelial keratitis, or it can lead to secondary inflammation where you get episcleritis, scleritis, and uh, cranial nerve palsies. And it can also give rise to uh, reactivation because it uh, the now when you get an infection, it will get uh, transmitted along the sensory nerve to the, tri the trigeminal ganglia, and then it can uh, get lodged there. They incorporate their DNA to the uh, host DNA, and then in, when the, in a case of a reactivation, it would uh, come back to come back along that particular nerve or some branch of that nerve and lead to a reactivation. And uh, so this was a case of uh, acute uh, soster. So she had a, uh, a history of uh, fever and burning sensation. And uh, usually when they present, they now here this patient was having a uh, lesion, but, um, uh, but sometimes they only pain with pain and the edema. So sometimes we, are, we mistake it as a uh, uh, periorbital cellulitis, but later on, but the pain is a very, it's a very excruciating type of a pain. And uh, uh, and uh, so with, with time they will develop the um, blisters and then we can we see, see that it is not uh, orbital cellul periorbital cellulitis preceptal cellulitis it is uh, herpes soster and uh, bilateral diseases are very rare and uh, usually the rash it itself does not uh, involve the lower part of the uh, lid and uh, it uh, but the edema it uh, and it does not spread to the other side but. When it comes to the edema, it spreads to the contralateral side as well. And there's an entity called herpes uh, sine, soster sine herpetae, where there's no rash, but uh, the other symptoms and signs are there. And then management-wise, this patient was managed with uh, oral acyclovir, 800 milligram, five times a day for uh, 10 days. And uh, in case uh, there's a uh, severe, if, you, if it is occurs in an immunocompromised patient or the patient is having a, uh, encephalitis, then we can give uh, intra intravenous acyclovir as well. Then steroids, uh, it's a bit controversial. It only increases the resolution, but it does not uh, increase the, uh, uh, reduce the risk of developing uh, herpes soster 
uh, uh, neuralgia uh, post herpetic but uh, it should on, always give given with combination with antiviral and definitely not in people who are immunodeficient now acute eye disease these are the uh, uh, complications you can get they can get uh, epithelial keratitis where there's a dendritic form which out a branching terminal bulb and conjunctivitis i already discussed the follicular type in nature this is the episcleritis where there's a localized patch of erythema and uh, then scleritis where there's thinning of the sclera and uh, these can be managed with NSAIDs or uh, steroids topical and uh, nimular keratitis is another complication of herpes zoster which can occur 10 days after and uh, they are treated with uh, topical steroids and uh, then there's a you know, interstitial keratitis another uh, 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 related complication and you can see there there's a uh, opaque or a hazy area in all in the cornea there's no uh, ulceration but uh, there's the stroma is involved here so you have to treat it with steroids here Discoform keratitis is another uh, uh, presentation and here there you can see here there's a circular disc like uh, lesion in the cornea again steroid but always it should be combined with combined with uh, antiviral anterior uveitis is something that is commonly seen in patients usually 50 to 30 percent of patients developed uh, anterior uveitis uh, following uh, herpes zoster ophthalmica so they need to be followed up regularly and uh, you need to refer the patient to ophthalmologist so they can uh, review the patient weekly up to six weeks and if they develop anterior uveitis they can start uh, treatment with topical steroid and sometimes you need to give another dose of oral acyclovir uh, for seven days and and if it's still persistent and perhaps the patient may need to be continued on a uh, prophylactic dose as well and uh, these are the retinal complication posterior uveitis it's a very aggressive retinitis usually unilateral commonly seen in immunodeficient individuals so here the lesion uh, initially occurs at the posterior pole and then spreads circumferentially so it can lead to a very uh, uh, the vision can be uh, reduced and lead to a very devastating effect so they need to be started on either uh, need to be started on intravitreal antivirals like uh, gancyclovir and uh, acute retinal necrosis is also uh, caused by varicella zoster and um, this they on unlike in posterior uh, retinal progressive retinal necrosis here the lesions occur in the periphery and then with time they will involve the posterior pole and posterior pole is the where you have the macula so then uh, later only their vision will start to go down so always posterior segment examination is a must in patient who have had herpes zoster ophthalmicus in treatment wise acute retinal necrosis they can be uh, started on um, intravitreal acyclovir and uh, then following that they need to be uh, continued oral acyclovir prophylactically here the oral acyclovir is again 800 milligram uh, five times a day and uh, neurological complications they can also present with the third nerve palsy which is the commonest and sixth nerve and uh, usually uh, they have uh, encephalitis really they can have uh, optic neuritis and encephalitis as well chronic eye diseases due to the uh, anesthetic effect of the uh, cornea due to the trigeminal nerve damage they can have neurotropic uh, keratopathy with uh, resulting in epithelial defect so they can have they have to be treated with uh, lubricants and uh, then um, sometimes a uh, uh, amniotic graft may be also be needed in these patients so these are the scleritis and lipid degeneration other complications and um, so my uh, third case is about a young girl she came with the uh, she came with the uh, lesions involved in the uh, phase for right eye for five days duration moderate pain and uh, complaint of photophobia also and there were blisters and uh, but they were localized and uh, uh, sweet lamp examination i uh, we saw that he was having follicular conjunctivitis and a dendritic ulcer this is the presentation so unlike in the previous uh, uh, picture here it, the lesions are confined to the upper lid and the lower lid both and uh, here the you can see the blisters are involved in the lower lid also so in the previous one only the upper lid had blisters so this one this uh, uh, girl we uh, diagnosed having hsv1 with epithelial keratitis so hsv1 usually infect above the waist so primary infection is by droplet transmission and uh, then uh, treatment wise because she was having a dendritic calcium we started on oral acyclovir you can either start in topical there's uh, but there's no 
evidence that antiviral treatment at this stage is going to uh, uh, cause any, uh, it's going to reduce the recurrence rate and uh, recurrent infection also like in um, uh, various, uh, herpes zoster, it get transmitted along the trigeminal nerve up the ganglia and they get lodged in there. And when, a reactive, when, a, when there's a stress uh, like in fever or uh, trauma, in such an insult is there, they can come down the uh, nerve and then infect the cornea or the conjunctiva. So there's no treatment at present to eradicate, eradicate the, um, uh, present the these uh, latent uh, uh, viruses that are lodged in the uh, trigeminal ganglia. And uh, the, so the pattern of disease may be different for that of the primary disease because it's not it, it will not necessarily get transmitted along the uh, branch where it uh, went uh, to the um, trigeminal ganglia. So the rate of recurrences is in HSV. 10% at one year and 50% at 10 years. So HSE keratitis here can be due to, uh, so the cornea has three layers. The outermost is the epithelium, then the stroma, and the innermost is the endothelium. So all three layers can be involved. Epithelial layer ha can have two types of ulcers, dendritic and geographic. And um, here, this is a dendritic ulcer. Here you can see it has a branching pattern. And um, then there are tapering, it's unlike in uh, Soster, it had terminal bulbs. And the uh, picture below, you can see it's a geographic, it is confluent and has an amoeboid appearance. So um, dendritic ulcer, uh, the cornea sensation is reduced and that was the um, uh, morphological picture you get. And uh, usually anterior chamber uh, infection, the inflammation is not there. And um, following healing, there might be a sub-epithelial haze that may persist for weeks. Geographic usually results following the lower picture. You can see the amoeboid appearance. It usually occurs following uh, steroid treatment where there's the, the lesions become confluent and give this appearance. So um, management-wise, we usually, uh, dendritic calcia also, we can start an oral acyclovir 400 milligram five times a day for 10 days or topical 3% uh, acyclovir ointment five times a day. And, uh, but they both have equivalent effect and usually the ulcer heal within two weeks. But um, if you're going the topical ointment, you need to do a bit of a uh, debriment with a cotton bud. So the penetration of the topical ointment is better. And there's no evidence at the moment, uh, there's no evidence that there's uh, the uh, giving both drugs, topical and oral accelerates the healing. So steroids should be avoided at this stage. And um, skin lesions, you can give ointment, but steroids is, uh, it's you, it's you should not give, should be avoided at all cost. Uh, geographic here, the dose is a bit different. Uh, also, I give 800 milligrams five times a day for 14 to uh, 21 days. And uh, usually epithelial uh, uh, ulcers, we don't give any uh, um, prophylactic treatment because it itself can, it's unlikely to, to uh, cause a corneal stromal involvement. Then the stromal keratitis, this can be divided with epithelial ulceration, without epithelial ulceration and with epithelial ulceration. If it's uh, without, so in the upper picture, upper uh, right-hand picture, you can see this is a interstitial keratitis. There's no epithelium involvement. And the lower one, there's epithelial involvement with a, a central corneal haze. So then the interstitial keratitis, you don't see any epithelial edema. And... Um, the treatment is oral day cycle of 400 milligram five times a day for 10 days. And afterwards we switch to the prophylactic dose, which is a cycle of 400 milligram twice daily. And this is continued up to one year. And topical steroid is also given at this stage, uh, initially with the increased frequency of uh, three to uh, four hours per day, and then tapered according to the uh, reduction in the inflammation. Then if it's epithelial with epithelial ulceration, which is also called necrotizing stromal keratitis, this is a suppurative condition and can be mistaken for a fungi or a bacterial keratitis. And uh, so in this case, at the uh, bottom picture, right? This is a case of a necrotizing stromal keratitis. Here, acyclovir dose is 800 milligram five times a day for seven to 10 days, and then followed up with, again, prophylactic dose, which is acyclovir 400 milligram BD. Again, this should be continued up to one year, because if you stop the drug before that, there's a high chance of recurrence. And here, topical steroids are also given, though the patient is having a epithelial uh, ulceration, but it is at a reduced uh, frequency, which is uh, twice daily. And um, 
then the diskiform keratitis or the endothelium endotheliitis. Here there's a central stromal involvement and then there's anterior chamber inf inflammation. And uh, you can mistake uh, from other lesions, how can you differentiate? You can check the corneal sensation. So this, yeah, you can see uh, the upper picture, there's a uh, decimate folds and then there are pigment uh, deposition in the lower one. So these all indicate a disciform keratitis and here you can see a circular margin and it's like a disc so that gives its name the disciform keratitis and prolonged uh, keratitis can give rise to vascularization of the cornea. Treatment again, 400 milligram five times a day for seven to 10 days followed by 400 milligram twice daily for one year. Predicillon, again, you start with the high frequency and then taper it down. And uh, so, but oral uh, antiviral lacyclovir need to be continued till the patient is on steroids. And the other complications involved neurotrophic, uh, neurotrophic keratopathy, which we discussed previously, and metahepatic ulcer is another entity. Sometimes when you treat, the ulcer epithelial defect does not heal. It is because, not due to the, um, uh, the virus, it is because of the drug toxicity. And uh, the, one, the moment you stop drugs or reduce the frequency, you can see an improvement. Then uh, my uh, last case is about a, a young uh, lady, 39 year old. She came five years ago with a severe drug relative to uh, mephenamine acid. And at that time she had purpuric uh, vascular hemorrhagic thin lesions and had mucosal involvement involving uh, crusting of the lips and involving the tongue also. And her ocular symptoms were not, it was not possible to examine at that stage. But later uh, when we examined, she was kind of having bilateral redness and uh, uh, severe uh, grittiness and uh, ocular examination also there was hemorrhagic cr crusting of the lid margin and there was membranes in the conjunctiva and uh, so this was managed as a Steven Johnson syndrome with ocular involvement by both dermatology and ophthalmic units so this was the initial presentation you can see the hemorrhagic crusting so Steven Johnson is a cell mediated delayed hypersensitive reaction and in the acute stage there's hemorrhagic crusting of the lid margins there can be mucopurulent conjunctivitis and there can be conjunctival membranes, pseudomembranes and uh, hyperemia. So here you can see uh, hemorrhagic crusting of the lid and the lower picture, bottom picture, you can see a membrane formation and it involves the uh, cornea also leading to uh, epithelial defects. Treatment, they need to be on um, lubricants, artificial tears and should uh, prevent corneal exposure. Topical steroids, are started to reduce inflammation and cyclopegia to relieve pain. And uh, uh, if they develop simpleferon, which are adhesions between the lid and the cornea, they need to be separated with a cotton bud or a glass rod. And uh, at the earliest possible instance, they should undergo a uh, amniotic membrane graft, which will increase the um, epithelium healing. And scleral ring is something that is put to prevent the simpleferon being formed. And uh, the membranes I showed you, if they are there, you can have them peeled and other uh, acute corneal problems like infection and uh, uh, should be also treated. Uh, chronic disease. Uh, so most of these people, irrespective of the degree of or the severity of the presentation, they end up with um, chronic uh, problems such as contentual cicatrization where there's a phone cell, which is the uh, gap between the uh, lid and the globe get become shortened and uh, there's keratinization of the conjunctiva and the lid margin. So every time the patient blinks, the, there's a abrasive plaque there and that will rub on the cornea and will lead to epithelium damage and the corneal damage. And then there will eyelid complication, right? Trichasis and uh, entropion, where the lid, the eye, uh, the lashes, they become inverted and they will rub on the cornea again, lead into uh, corneal damage. So here, this is the actual uh, photos of that patient. And here you can see the upper uh, left picture. The patient is uh, having uh, the conjunctiva is cut and the, the lower lid is, is devoid of uh, eyelashes, which is called madurosis. And she had undergone a uh, penetrating keratoplasty because the uh, cornea has become damaged. And uh, the lower one, the left eye had a, slight, a better prognosis and uh, better outcome. And here, the also you can see that the lower eyelid is devoid of eyelashes and uh, the left bottom picture you can see eyelashes are in turn inward this is called um, entropion with the lid it has become in, uh, inverted uh, and the right bottom picture there are adhesions between the um, the inner surface of the eyelid and the globe 
these are called simple ferrons. So if they come to this stage, you have to mechanically remove them with a resection, but early stages, you can have them removed with a glass rod. And here, uh, upper left, there's a, a, the keratinization of the lid and uh, the right one, you can see um, conjunctival scarring. So ocular treatment in uh, these chronic diseases uh, consists of lubrication again, treatment of aberrant lashes where you can remove them with epilation or giving bandage contact lenses which will protect the cornea uh, and or mucus. So if usually the, um, the conjunctiva here is ischemic, so they need to have some vascularization and you give uh, transport to them, you can go ahead with the mucous membrane grafting and uh, uh, for phony cell reconstruction also. Here the graft is taken from the buccal mucosa. And uh, corneal rehabilitation, uh, usually don't do uh, penetrating keratoplasty where you uh, graft a cornea from a, another person to the uh, deceased person because you need to, uh, if you need stem cells to maintain the cornea, but here usually the stem cell population is destroyed in uh, Steven Johnson. So uh, you either go for a um, uh, lamellar keratoplasty if it's thin, or a keratoprosthesis implantation, uh, which are, are the osteoodonto keratoprosthesis, where they take a root of the, they take the tooth along with the alveolar bone and then uh, inject a uh, lens uh, or a Boston type K prosthesis. So here you can see that. Uh, one is the upper lift is the, um, the PK or DALC, and uh, the upper right is a patient who had undergone the osteodonto keratoprosthesis and here I did such right. right. So this is that patient afterwards. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vichira, uh, for your excellent case presentation. Now we'll be moving into a review lecture that will summarize the current literature that are related to the cases. And that will be conducted by Dr. Pradipa Sirivardhan, who is a consultant eye surgeon from the National Hospital Colombo. Dr. Pradipa, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my, my lecture is uh, going to be an overview of uh, dermatological conditions with associated eye conditions, uh, considering the fact that both the skin and the eye uh, arise from the uh, same embryological origin, that is the uh, ectoderm, uh, it is surprising that there are so many uh, conditions in which both the uh, skin and the eye get affected. So I have listed the uh, disorders here. There are inherited disorders, systemic diseases with skin and eye involvement, then skin diseases affecting lid skin and lashes, atopy and atopic eye diseases, cicatrizing conjunctivitis and immunobulous disorders, and uh, infections, tumors, and then I'm going to touch upon the killer complications of dermatological treatment. Now let's talk about inherited disorders first. Uh, connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome is associated with eye conditions such as ectopia lentis, that is uh, subluxation of the lens and uh, retinal detachment. So uh, this is the Marfanoid habitus, and uh, this is the lens which is subluxated uh, superotemporally. Uh, now, connective disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is also associated uh, with eye conditions, such as uh, blue sclera, that is due to the thinning of the sclera, where the under underlying choroid is visible, and angioid streaks. Uh, so the, in uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, this uh, stretchable skin is seen. Pseudosanthoma elasticum, where you see the typical chicken skin appearance, is also associated with this angioid streak appearance in the uh, retina. This is due to the uh, uh, ruptures in the layer uh, that is between the choroid and the retina, that is the uh, Brooks membrane. Now, uh, certain syndromes associated with dysplasia, hyperplasia, and aplasia what is known as blepharophimosis, ptosis, epicanthus inversus syndrome. Uh, here, there is a, this is an autosomal uh, dominant inherited disorder uh, where there is congenital ptosis, this short uh, palpable fissure, and this epicanthic fold going from the lower lid skin. 
keratinization disorders like ichthyosis uh, gives rise to uh, ectropian, lowly ectropian with corneal exposure. Uh, diseases like homocystinuria, uh, which are metabolic disorders, is also associated with ectopia lentis. Neurocutaneous syndromes, in which both the eye and the skin are involved, are neurofibromatosis 1, which is associated with cutaneous neurofibromas, leash nodules of the iris, then cafe au lait spots on the skin, and axillary flicking. Uh, tuberous sclerosis, with the typical adenomacibation, is also associated with the uh, retinal astrocytoma. Now, photosensitization disorders like seroderma pigmentosum uh, are associated with skin keratinization followed by uh, malignant lesions of the skin. Basal cell nevus syndrome is also a disorder of, uh, related to photosensitization where there is uh, base, multiple basal cell carcinomas around the eye. Pigmentary disorders uh, such as ocular cutaneous albinism are associated with uh, impaired vision in the eye due to hypoplasia of the optic nerve and hypoplasia of the uh, fovea of the retina, as well as refractive disorders. These patients present with this diaphanous iris and nystagmus. Vascular and hematological syndromes, such as third fever syndrome, are associated with uh, this typical port wine stain of the skin uh, with the hypertrophy of the uh, subcutaneous tissues, uh, choroidal angioma, and also uh, these patients present with fits due to the meningeal calcification. Now, systemic disorders with eye and skin involvement include sarcoidosis, which presents with the granulomatous uh, anterior uveitis, lid granulomas and uh, multiple uh, features in the posterior segment, including candle wax drippings uh, and uh, other changes of posterior uveitis. Jogren syndrome uh, manifests in the eye as, a, as dry eye disease. SLE, which is associated with multiple skin involvement, manifests in the eye as ferritis and retinal vasculitis. Now, disorders like Reiter's syndrome, Bechet's disease, and inflammatory bowel disease manifests in the eye as acute anterior uveitis. Bechet's disease also affects the posterior segment where it presents as a retinal vasculitis. Granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly known as vaginous granulomatosis, uh, manifests in the eye as a scleritis. Now, it involves the uh, lower uh, respiratory tract as well as the uh, sinuses and the upper respiratory tract. Uh, this is a CT scan where the lesions from the sinus is invaded in the orbit and this picture shows the typical spheritis. AIDS and H or HIV is also associated with uh, multiple eye lesions which include Kaposi's sarcoma of the conjunctiva the typical retinal microangiopathy due to the HIV virus, which manifests as multiple cotton wool spots, and the CMV retinitis with the typical pizza pie appearance uh, of the retina. Diseases involving the skin, lid skin and lashes include contact dermatitis, pigmentary changes, and the seborrheic dermatitis. Diseases of lid margin, uh, involving the anterior lid margin, uh, there will be uh, staphylococcus blepharitis and seborrheic blepharitis. Posterior lid margin with the meibomian glands can be affected by uh, meibomitis or ocular rosacea, meibomian gland dysfunction or meibomian seborrhea. Treatment of lid margin disease differs. Anterior lid margin disease needs to be treated by antibiotics because here you have to treat the infection 
due to Steph and mixed Steph and seborrheic groups. Uh, here, topical antibiotics is given as well as oral antibiotics. The lead margins need to be scrubbed uh, because the to get rid of the buildup so that the uh, antibiotics can gain access to the mar lead margins. The treatment of posterior lead margin disease involves mechanically unblocking the mebumin glands because here the disease is due to the inspissated secretions in the mebumin glands. Now here, hot compressors massaging to empty the uh, lipid from the glands uh, involves and uh, oral tetracycline and erythromycin is also beneficial because oral tetracycline and tetras other tetracycline drugs are supposed to alter the lipid composition of the mebomian glands and make the uh, secretions more fluid. Atopic eye diseases involve seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, perennial allergic conjunctivitis, and atopic keratoconjunctivitis, as well as vernal keratoconjunctivitis. Now, atopic keratoconjunctivitis is a more sinister disorder because it can leave the eye with residual damage. It is a non-seasonal chronic disorder uh, and associated with atopy and atopic dermatitis. There is formation of papillae on the undersurface of the lids and uh, various corneal manifestations. There are other uh, ocular manifestations such as cataract and keratoconus due to uh, atopic keratoconjunctivitis. These patients are more prone to develop Staphylococcal blepharitis and HSV keratitis. And because this is a long standing uh, disorder which needs to be controlled to prevent the uh, side effects, they may need uh, systemic immunosuppressives. Werner keratoconjunctivitis is different because it is a, a seasonal disease. It is a chronic disease with seasonal manifestations. Here you see the typical trantas dots at the limbus of the cornea due to accumulation of eosinophils. This slide also shows uh, trantas dots. This is the uh, typical giant papillae. Uh, and these patients present with severe itching. These are the corneal manifestations. The shield ulcer. This is an early shield ulcer. This is a delayed uh, advanced shield ulcer. So uh, now uh, there are three forms palpable involving the lids, the limbus where the uh, trenta dots are there and the corneal. Now these patients, uh, the acute exacerbations need to be treated with short courses of topical steroids while uh, mast cell stabilizers and antihistamines are need to be used on a long term basis. Cicatrizing conjunctivitis and immunobullous disorders affecting the eye involve uh, erythema multiforme, minor and major, which is Steven Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, graft versus host disease, mucous membrane pemphigoid, and linear IgA disease, as well as dermatitis herpetiformis. Now, mucous membrane pemphigoid is an insidious onset disease where the lesion often start at the medial canthus with loss of plica and the caramcle. There is subepithelial reticular fibrosis of tarsal conjunctiva and conjunctival infiltration, which eventually leads to shortening of the phonesis, symblepharon formation, blepharitis, trichiasis, and entropion, which finally leads to phonial changes and keratinization of the surface of the eye. Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis is an acute inflammatory vesicular bullous reaction of skin and mucous membranes. Uh, the mucoparvulent conjunctivitis and episcleritis are the ocular manifestations. The skin may have the classic target lesions and bully and areas of necrosis. Now, uh, these are the early changes. And late manifestations include complete keratinization of the surface of the eye. And here, uh, the keratoprosthesis is seen. Because in these patients, the uh, tear film is impaired due to 
uh, extensive damage to the structures responsible for formation of the tear film. Infections include viral infections like such as herpes simplex. This is the primary herpes simplex, herpes zoster, uh, molluscum contagiosum, which causes a follicular conjunctivitis in the eye, and viral warts. Uh, bacterial infections in and around the eye include streptococcal and staphylococcal infections. This is the sty, commonly due to uh, staphylococcus infection, and this is the internal bordiolum due to infection of a meibomian gland. Tumors uh, involving the skin around the eye may be benign, such as nevi, xanthalesma, or the port wine stain of Sturge Weber's syndrome, or they may be malignant. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and the head vacanthoma, which was earlier thought to be benign, but now is considered malignant, and sebaceous cell carcinoma arising from the meibomian glands. Uh, finally, we, let us talk about the ocular complications of dermatological treatment. Commonly used uh, dermatological drugs are corticosteroids oral retinoids, anti-malarials, and sorolins. Corticosteroids have multiple effects on the eye. The most sinister are the uh, steroid-induced intra, uh, elevated intraocular pressure, or which may progress to glaucoma with optic nerve damage. And the other one is the uh, posterior subcapsular cataract. Uh, in addition to this, there may be increased uh, tendency uh, for the patient to develop infections on the surface of the eye. This is the typical posterior subcapsular cataract. This is the optic nerve cupping due to the uh, steroid induced glaucoma. Retinoids such as itotretinoin gives rise to dry eye disease, impaired night vision, and benign intracranial hypertension. HCQ is the commonest drug on which most of the patients uh, who are referred from the dermatology clinics come to the eye clinic. Now, there are certain risk factors for uh, retinal toxicity due to HCQ, which include a daily dose of more than five milligrams per kilogram absolute body weight, a duration of use of more than five years, uh, renal disease, and if the patient is on concomitant drugs such as tamoxifen, which also tends to have a retinal toxicity and patients with coexisting macular disease where the, uh, there may be further damage or there may be difficulty in monitoring the uh, toxicity. Now, older age liver disease also are minor risk factors. Now, this is the protocol for screening for HCQ-induced maculopathy. At the baseline, before starting the treatment, the visual acuity and automated uh, Humphrey tend to uh, visual field is done. Then one or more of the subjective test, which is fluorescent angiogram, sorry, uh, fundus autofluorescence, uh, multifocal ERG or OCT is done. And after three years of treatment, the, uh, they need re regular ocular examinations, repeat visual field tests and repeat of those objective tests. If toxicity is suspected, visual field tests have to be repeated, and more objective tests uh, may need to be repeated, and the patient may need frequent follow-up. Once the toxicity is confirmed, the, con the medication has to be discontinued, but the damage must may persist even after the discontinuation of the treatment. So this is the typical visual field changes seen in HCQ maculopathy on a 10 dash visual field. And this is the typical bullseye maculopathy due to the uh, HCQ. And this is the picture seen in uh, OCT. Here, this is the normal OCT. And uh, this is the appearance of a patient with HCQ toxicity. There's this uh, flying source appearance in the macula area. And this is the fundus autofluorescence picture. And this is the uh, normal multifocal ERG. Whereas this is the multifocal ERG in a patient with 
uh, it's CQ toxicity. The other drugs uh, that have an effect are soralins, P-U-V-A, can have a, uh, can increase the risk of patients having cataracts. So I have uh, done a brief outline of conditions that affect both the skin and the eye together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradeepa. Uh, now uh, we'll move into the interactive section. That's the MCQs followed by the picture piece. And the MCQ discussion will be done by uh, Dr. Kushlani Gunaratna, again a consultant eye surgeon from the National Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Kushlani. Good afternoon. So I'll start some MCQs uh, related to the eye in dermatology. So the first question is, a 40-year-old male presented with multiple cafeole spots over the arms and the trunk with freckling in the axillary region. Which of the following ocular manifestations are considered to be diagnostic in this condition? A, Horner syndrome, B, optic glioma, C, plexiform neurofibroma of the eyelid, D, pulsatile proptosis, and E, two or more leash nodules. So what is this patient having? Patient is having neurofibromatosis type 2. So A is false. The rest of the responses are true. So we look at the NIH criteria for diagnosis of NF1. Uh, you can see optic nerve glioma, leash nodules, two or more neurofibromas or plexiform neurofibromas and sphenoidal dysplasia, if you have, are included in the NIH criteria for the diagnosis of NF1. So NF1 can have ptosis and commonly neurofibromatosis, it's Type 1, you see plexiform neurofibromas causing the ptosis, and their vision also can get affected if the ptosis obstructs the visual axis. Horner syndrome is very rare with NF1, but it can happen due to a neurofibroma compressing the sympathetic trunk. You can see in Horner syndrome, they have partial ptosis with constricted pupils called meiosis and anhydrosis. So optic nerve gliomas are seen in neurofibromatosis type 1. And you can see here, if you see bilateral neurofibro uh, optic nerve gliomas, right? you can see the spindle shape enlargement of the optic nerve. So if you see bilateral involvement, you must think of NF1. Then sphenoidal dysplasia. Now the roof of the orbit is formed by the sphenoid bone, greater than the sphenoid bone. So you can see here, the due to sphenoidal dysplasia, there is herniation of the brain tissue causing a pulsatile proptosis. So if you see uh, anyone with a pulsatile proptosis uh, without brewery, you have to look for sphenoidal dysplasia and that can be that patient most likely has NF1. Neurofibromas type 1. Leash nodules are seen in NF1. There you can see they are pale in color. They are slightly elevated. You can see them to the naked eye. And they are hematomas. They are asymptomatic. And the number of leash nodules increase in number with uh, age. So let's go to the next MCQ. Um, which of the following is or are true regarding hydroxychloroquine toxicity? A, advanced HCQ toxicity presents as a bullseye maculopathy. B, concomitant retinal conditions predispose to toxicity. C, keratopathy is rare when the dose is less than 5 milligrams per kg. Patient, is asymptomatic due to the initial stages of toxicity. E, the risk of toxicity is low 
during the first five years of treatment. So all the responses are true. And as Pradipa said, uh, in advance, it's UQ toxicity. You develop a bullseye maculopathy. In this stage, they also, the vision is affected. And even if you stop the HCQ at this stage, the, there can be deterioration of the vision. So let's look at the risk of HCQ toxicity. The daily dose is less than five milligrams per kg. Uh, toxicity, the chances of developing are less. Up to five years is under 1%, and up to 10 years is under 2%, rises to about 20% after 20 years. And the risk of toxicity is higher when they have concomitant renal disease, concomitant use of tamoxifen that is used in breast cancer, and underlying retinal disorders like age-related macular degeneration. So let's go to the third question. A 30-year-old man presented with recurrent, painful, oral and genital ulcers. He also had photophobia with reduced vision. What are the ocular manifestations associated with this condition? A, branch retinal artery occlusion, B, branch retinal vein occlusion, C, necrotizing retinal, necrotizing retinal vasculitis, D, proptosis, and E, transient hypopia. So what is this patient having? Uveitis with recurrent painful oral and genital ulcers. So uveitis patients can present with photophobia and reduced vision. So except for proptosis, the rest of the responses are true. So this is due to Bache's disease. In Bache's disease, arteries and veins both are involved. You can see in Bache's disease, they can have a transient hypopian. Hypopian is an exudate, which you see in the anterior chamber, mainly consisting of white blood cells. And this exudate, this hypopian is mobile. When you move the head, the hypopian shifts. So it's characteristic and it's seen with patients. So ocular manifestations affect about 70% of Bichette's patients. They have panuveitis or anteruveitis with transient hypopian. Side threatening manifestations are related to the posterior segment. They can get a necrotizing retinal vasculitis that affects both arteries and veins. And like in sarcoid, it's mainly the veins that are involved. So question MCQ number four, which of the following is or are true regarding leprosy? A, ocular signs are principally due to indirect invasion of lepra bacilli into the eye structures. B, iris pearls are pathognomonic. C, leg of thalamus is due to type one reaction. D, it causes corneal hyperesthesia. E, acute iritis occurs in multibacillary leprosy. So A is false and the rest of the responses are true. Ocular signs are principally due to direct invasion of leprobacillus. Iris pearls are tiny white clumps. Here you can see them. On histology, they consist of M. leprecas. They are asymptomatic, only seen in long-standing multibacillary leprosy. And it's rare since the use of multidrug therapy. Lag of thalamus is a poor lid closure. You can see here. So you need to, when you see a patient whose patch, pale patch of skin is seen close to the eye, right, over the area of the facial nerve, they can develop sudden type one reaction leading to lag of thalamus. So therefore it is important when, when you see such a patient to uh, 
anticipate that they might develop a, a type 1 reaction and they can get leg of thalamus. So how do we detect early, uh, the, what are the signs of early leg of thalamus? Right. We tell, tell them to close their eyelids tightly and if you can separate the upper and the lower lid with ease, that means that indicates orbicularis weakness. And if the upper lid and the lower lid, the gap is greater than one millimeter, that indicates lack of thermos. So then these patients should be treated with oral steroids so that the patient never recovers, otherwise undetected. It, if lack of thermos lasts, it causes corneal exposure keratopathy and that can lead to uh, poor vision. So corneal hypoesthesia or decreased corneal sensation is due to type 1 reactions involving the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. So you need to check their corneal sensations to see whether they are developed. And acute iritis occurs due to type 2 reaction. That's also called erythema nodosum leprosum reactions. It's an antigen antibody reaction and it occurs in multibacillary patients. They can also get present with acute scleritis. So they can come with a painful red eye uh, due to a type 2 reaction. So the fifth question is, a 70-year-old woman presented with a history of painful vesicular rash over her forehead and the tip of the nose. Which of the following ocular finding, findings is or are consistent with the above history? A corneal epithelial keratitis, B, decreased corneal sensation, C, loss of vision, D, low intraocular pressures, E, painful red eye. So D is false, and the rest of the responses are true. Richard gave a very good account of herpes osteophthalmicus, and uh, you can see uh, due to, when you see a lesion here, the tip of the nose, you should very likely that the eye is involved. That's called Hutchison's sign. Painful red eye can be due to the uveitis. And generally the intraocular pressures are high, not low. So that's why D is wrong. They can get trabeculitis and they have a high intraocular pressure. So let's go to the sixth question. What are the ocular manifestations of Steven Johnson syndrome include? A, bilateral conjunctival hyperemia. B, pseudomembrane formation, exconeal vascularization, dry eyes, and lead margin keratinization. So all the responses are correct. And it's important because bilateral conjunctival hyperemia is a common manifestation of Steven Johnson syndrome. And uh, you need to treat very early to, with topical steroids, adequate artificial tears, preservative free, and early amniotic membrane transplantation is needed to prevent late complications such as corneal vascularization and, and uh, scarring. So it's totally avoidable if you start treatment very early when you see a patient with steroid Johnson. So the seventh question is, a 40 year old man presented with a rapid reduction in vision in both eyes. He had a reddish brown, painless, non itchy, rough rash on the trunk, palms, and the soles about six weeks before the onset of the visual deterioration. What are the ocular manifestations associated with this condition? A. Ground glass retinitis, B. Uveitis, C. Dilated iris vessels, D. Chorioretinitis, and E. Optic neuritis. So what is this man having? A red, brown rash, painless, non itchy a rough rash over the trunk and palms and soles associated with poor vision. So it's syphilis. So all the responses are true. Syphilis can mimic other etiologies. It's a great imitator. So you have to it's have a high index of suspicion. You can see granulomatous oveitis. You can see the granulomatous keratitis here. 
Phytophthalatic precipitates are seen in syphilitic uveitis, even in tuberculous uveitis, it has a very similar picture. And you can see here the ground glass retinitis with vasculitis. In syphilis, uh, arteries and veins both are affected. Are but like in bishes, also you get arteries and veins affected. TB and in sarcoidosis is mainly the veins that are affected. So the eighth MCQ is in which of the following conditions with erythema nodosum is uveitis also seen? A. Tuberculosis B. Sarcoidosis C. Bechet's disease D. Ulcerative colitis and E. Lymphoma. So, all the responses are true. Uveitis can be present in all these conditions and it can also can have erythema nodosum. So the final MCQ is uh, on angioid streaks. In which of the following conditions are angioid streaks seen? You can see the angioid streaks. They are radiating from the peripapal region, radiate outwards. You can see the serrated edges. A, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. B, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. C, thalassemia. D, senile elastosis, E, syphilis. Syphilis is false. The other responses are true. So angiostrics are asymptomatic, but they are, with time, they can cause, reduct, their vision can get affected due to choroidal neovascularization. They can get choroidal rupture due to minor trauma, so they need to avoid contact sports. So, Thank you. So that's all the MCQs. Thank you, Dr. Kushlani. Uh, next session will be a picture quiz. It will be conducted uh, by Dr. Niranjala Vidhanagi, who is a senior registrar in pediatric ophthalmology. And uh, he'll be discussing dermatological conditions with eye involvement in children. Over to you, Dr. Niranjala. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Ranjana Vidhanagi, uh, senior registrar in Opidectric of Pyrology. Uh, today I'm going to discuss with you regarding the dermatological manifestations of uh, ocular conditions among children. So these are the topics I'm going to discuss with you today. Um, these are the uh, common uh, conditions we can see uh, in Sri Lanka with the dermatological manifestation with as well as eye involvement. So uh, the topics are um, ocleodermal melanocytosis. It is called as nevus of Ota in uh, capillary hemangioma, also called as strawberry nevus, acne of CKA, molluscum contagiosum, Kawasaki disease, treptomyosarcoma, allergic conditions, as well as phacomatosis. So the first condition is nevus of Ota or ocleodermal melanocytosis. Uh, here's a, a typical pictures. Um, in this, in this is a congenital condition. It is due to uh, increased number of melanocytes in sclera, ovia, periorbital skin, orbit, meninges, as well as soft, soft palate. Uh, there are three types. Um, it, it may be only ocular involvement. It is called as ocular melanocytosis. It may be only dermal uh, component only. It is called as dermal melanocytosis. Or it may be involved both uh, organs, uh, skin and the, the eye. So it is called nevus of product. So uh, it is important uh, as uh, soon as you uh, see a patient with uh, periorbital, uh, the hyperpigmented lesion, uh, refer to the ophthalmologist to exclude the association of the eye as well as the uh, complications. So these are the associations iris hyperchromia, iris mammulations. A fundus hyperpigmentation. So we have to direct the pupil and see. Then the trabecular hyperpigmentation this is a very important uh, feature. Uh, to uh, see the trabecular measure, we have to do the gonioscopy. So if the uh, trabecular hyperpigmentation is associated with the oculodermal melanocytosis, it may be associated with glaucoma. So we have to uh, follow up the patient uh, to identify the glaucoma as well as 
to uh, start treatment as well as complications. Uh, the other one is oval melanoma. So that's uh, about the uh, nevus of OTA. The second one is acne rosicae. And this is a very a common condition among teenagers. Uh, we have to uh, differentiate this between uh, acne rosicae as well uh, with the uh, acne vulgaris. I'll discuss uh, regarding the uh, differentiating features. Uh, this is a common idiopathic dermatosis involving sun exposed skin, the face, and um, upper neck, as you can see in this picture. Uh, ocular complications develop only uh, among the 60 to 18 percent of people, children. So the uh, skin uh, you can uh, see uh, as facial telangiectasis, papule and pastule formation, fine fibroma, as well as facial crushing uh, of the skin. Uh, in as I said earlier, in contrast to acne vulgaris, comedons are absent in acne rosicae. So etiology is multifactorial. So it may be vascular, uh, abnormal response to commensal skin bacteria and uh, demodix follicular mites. So if the uh, patient is having um, eye involvement uh, together with the skin involvement, patient may complain of irritation and inflammation. So better to refer to the ophthalmologist. What are the signs of um, eye involvement? We can categorize it into lid signs, conjunctival signs, as well as corneal signs. The lid signs mainly because of meibomian gland uh, dysfunction, uh, because of the uh, alteration of fatty acid uh, component. So uh, we can uh, see as a ma marginal tilting dictasia, posterior vaporitis, uh, or meibomian gland cyst formation. In the conjunctiva, we can see as bulbar hyperemia, sequestral conjunctivitis, uh, conjunctival granuloma, as well as a uh, fit neurosis. Uh, the um, corneal, uh, we can see a lot of changes, inferior punctate epithelial erosions, peripheral vascularization, marginal keratitis, focal low diffuse corneal thinning, maybe may lead to perforations and scarring and vascularization. So these are very, um, uh, uh, the outcomes are not that much good for the vision. So uh, it's very important if the patient is having eye signs and symptoms uh, to refer to the uh, ophthalmologist. So treatment-wise, this brief dis uh, description, a frequent lubrication, hot compresses and lid hygiene uh, for the, uh, as I said earlier, because of uh, the main reason is because of meibomian gland dysfunction. These are to uh, reduce the fatty acid co uh, composition in the meibomian glands. Then topical antibiotics such as uh, fusidic acid, erythromycin and azithromycin and uh, steroids only for exacerbation because this is a condition with a long-term run. Uh, this will not cure within a few days. So we can't use steroids for long-term because of side effects. So we, we are using the steroids only for acute exacerbations. Uh, we, are, we have to use systemic therapy as well. The best drug is tetracycline. It has lots of uh, effects uh, like uh, maybe gland function uh, alter alteration due to lower fatty acid production, reduced lead for up, anti-inflammatory as well as anti-collagenesis. But in children, we can't use tetracycline, so we are using tetracycline for the children. And uh, if the patient, the, if the symptoms are very severe, sometimes patients are presented with very severe features. Uh, in that case, we have to use the immunosuppression such as acetromycin, and the other option is retinoid. The next topic is uh, capillary hemangioma or strawberry nevus. So um, this is a typical presentation. A, um, there will be a um, um, traced white red lesion uh, over the upper lid involving the periorbital uh, skin, but uh, uh, usually present with uh, ptosis as well because of this lesion. But uh, if we can see this as only a uh, Periorbital lesion. This may be action in the orbit as well. Therefore, as soon as you see this, uh, the uh, child is this presentation, refer to the ophthalmologist. So, one of the most common uh, tumors in infancy, uh, it is three times common in boys than girls, present shortly after birth, not at the birth usually. Shortly after birth, as a unilateral placed light radiation, usually in the upper lip, as this a picture. 
uh, usually on the uh, deep lesions appear as bright purplish. So ptosis is frequent. The uh, most important thing is it blanches on pressure in contrast to the port pine stain. I'll discuss with you regarding the port pine stain in the next slides uh, with Sturge Weber syndrome. It is not blanches on pressure, but this lesion blanches on pressure. So, and it may swell on climb as well. So, uh, maybe as I said, maybe orbital extensions so always we have to rule out that. Um, imaging for the, uh, uh, except for the small, very small lesions. So, we are performing the imaging to exclude the orbital extension. Uh, uh, other, uh, other than the uh, upper lid and the periorbital skin, the lesions may involve the skin of the other areas, uh, face, other areas of the first face as well. So uh, some have strawberry nevus on the other parts of the body. Uh, histopathologically shows proliferation of varying sized vascular channels in dermis as well as subcutaneous tissue. Uh, may associate with multiple cutaneous, le cutaneous lesions and visceral hemangioma. So consider systemic adjustment in appropriate cases. Treatment wise, uh, this has a very uh, a natural course. We have, I have described you regarding that uh, briefly. It has a proliferative phase. Uh, that means rapid growth uh, to uh, three to six months after diagnosis, followed by slower phase of natural resolution. 30% uh, of children by three years and 75% uh, of children by seven years. So um, it uh, usually it, uh, disappears uh, at the age of seven to eight years. So uh, not all the patients need uh, treatment. A treatment indicated for the uh, amblyopia secondary to the astigmatism, anisometropia, occlusion for the stabis, occlusion or strabismus, and less commonly for cosmesis, optic nerve compression, and exposure keratopathy. So I uh, I just uh, concerned about the lesion involved in the only the periorbital uh, skin, but for the orbital lesions we have to uh, go for a um, intervention. So these are the brief uh, description regarding the. Uh, management. Uh, the main uh, state of management is beta blockers. We can uh, use oral as well as topical uh, preparations. Oral uh, propanol under supervision because it has a lot of side effects. Then topical tinol uh, over the lesion applied. Over the, we have to uh, apply over the lesion. Uh, regarding the steroids, uh, we can inject triamcinolone, one two milliliters, total of forty milligram per milliliter. Uh, then beta methasone as well uh, into cutaneous and preceptual tumors. Uh, but most important thing is not to inject deep into the orbit because of side effects. Then we can use the topical high potency steroids such as uh, clobitazole and systemic steroids daily for several weeks uh, if the, uh, for the appropriate patients. Uh, then for the superficial the lesion, uh, skin lesion, we can use the laser to close the blood vessels in superficial lesion if the size is less than two millimeters. Uh, if the patient is resistant to the steroids, we can use interferon alpha 2a as well as finfistine. Uh, and the, the lesion is on anterior and circumscribed. We can use the laser resection, local resection with the uh, cutting cortri as well as carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide laser. Uh, these regarding molluscum condensiosum. Um, uh, this is skin infection caused by pox virus. The single or multiple pale waxy umbilical nodules. You can see this may be single or multiple pale waxy, and there's an umbilical lesion at the center of the lesion. White cheese material can be expressed from the lesion, typically affects otherwise healthy children. Uh, transmission by contact and subsequently by the uh, auto inoculation, peak incidence between two to four years of age. Uh, if the patient is child is immunocompromised, the lesions may be multiple and confluent. Histopathology, uh, hyperplastic epidermis and a central pit containing intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. It is a pathological diagnosis. So uh, uh, sometimes the lesion only in the lead margin. So lesion on the lead margin may shed virus into the tear field and give rise to secondary chronic follicular conjunctivitis. So unless the lead margin is examined carefully, the causative molluscum lesion may be overlooked. Not like this, these patients, the uh, lesion may be only in the lead margin. So if uh, suspicious is there, please refer to the ophthalmologist. 
treatment wise uh, usually uh, spontaneous resolution is there within few months unless complicated with a secondary conjunctivitis so uh, if the patient have uh, developing uh, complications we can uh, go for shave excision cauterization chemical ablation cryotherapy or pulse dilator the next one is kawasaki disease uh, you can see the um, manifestations um, uh, skin manifestations and the uh, lips as well as the eye uh, this is syndrome of unknown etiology uh, mainly affect the children under 5 years of, uh, of age uh, systemic vasculitis that affect small and medium blood vessels of the body particularly as you know coronary arteries uh, it has a uh, six major diagnostic criteria i'm not going to discuss with you regarding all the diagnostic criteria but one is bilateral conjunctivitis so if you are uh, having suspicious about the kawasaki please refer to the ophthalmologist uh, to exclude the conjunctivitis this finding is present in 88 to 96 it's a very uh, high uh, uh, number of cases so uh, be careful uh, about the eye involvement the it is characterized by bulb conjunctival injection without chemosis there's no chemosis and pallon discharge as well as corneal involvement the next one is tabdomyosarcoma this is a very uh, important topic to be discussed because uh, even though patient is having a tumor inside the eye uh, the patient may present with pedi- uh, first to the pediatrician or dermatologist because of the first presentation may be uh, ecchymotic or periorbital swelling without uh, the features of tumor such as proptosis so these are the uh, some pictures most common soft tissue sarcoma of childhood most uh, common primary orbital malignancy in children 40% develop in head and neck average age of patient is 7 years uh, so the tumor derived from undifferentiated mesenchymal cells that have potential to develop into striated muscles there are four subtypes embryonal alveolar botryoid and pleomorphic it is a rapidly progressive unilateral proptosis that may mimic orbital cellulitis as i said there earlier the patient may come in with periorbital swelling um, with the features of orbital cellulitis but there's no warmth swelling and redness of the wearing uh, overlying skin develop but no warmth so uh, as well as the as i said earlier the ecchymotic patch is there around the eye so ct and mri shows poorly defined mass of homogeneous density with adjacent bony destruction the diagnosis is by the incisional biopsy and histopathology the systemic investigation for the metastasis because uh, it can rapidly uh, spread to the uh, adjacent bone and as well as lung the treatment with the under guidelines of irgc uh, it may include radiotherapy chemotherapy or surgical debulking a uh, prognosis wise good if confined to the orbit so uh, al- regarding allergic conditions i i discuss very, uh, with you regarding two uh, allergic conditions acute allergic edema contact dermatitis and the atopic dermatitis um acute allergic edema it's a, a patient the child is present with sudden onset foggy periorbital edema accompanied with uh, conjunctival swelling as seen in this picture this is a very rapid onset periorbital edema with conjunctival swelling uh, uh, injection uh, this followed uh, due to the exposure of to pollen or by insect bites uh, treatment is often unnecessary but uh, sometimes we are using the antihistamines the second one is contact dermatitis this is the uh, typical picture uh, uh, of appearance of the uh, periorbital lesion contact a dermatitis this is a following exposure to medications such as eye drops cosmetics or metals sent aside by the first exposure and develop immune reaction to further exposure so it is a type 4 hypersensitivity the signs are uh, you can see clearly in this picture uh, lit skin scaling angular fissuring edema and tightness chemosis redness and papillary conjunctivitis cornea you can see punctate epithelial erosions treatments the mainstay of treatment is avoidance of the allergen exposure as well as cold compresses topical steroids as well as oral histamines 
the, the third one is eczema or atopic dermatitis. It's a very common idiopathic condition. This is the typical appearance. Um, typically occurring in patients who also suffer from asthma and hay fever. So uh, it is important to get a, get a brief history. Eye involvement is relatively infrequent. The signs are thickening, crusting, and fissuring of the eyelids. Um, Staphylococcal nephritis, or atopic keratoconditis. Treatment wise, uh, you can use the lid emollients for uh, hydrating the skin as well as uh, a mild a topical steroids like fun person hydrocortisone. So, this is my last um, topic phacomatosis. It is also called as neuropetonous disorders. Phacomatosis uh, means uh, the uh, disease involving the three organs a skin, eye, as well as CNS. So these are the, there are several fake controls, but I selected uh, these four because they are uh, this bit com common among children in Sri Lanka. First one is neurofibromatosis. So you can see the eye involvement. This is a flex form uh, neurofibromatosis involved in the upper eyelid, lead to S-shaped deformity. These are the dermatological manifestations, multiple neurofibromatosis, as well as um, capillate patches. Uh, disorder primarily affects cell growth in neural tissue, two types, NF1 and NF2. Systemic features are neurofibromas, skin uh, caffeolate matules, axillary and inguinal freckles, skeletal abdominal like scoliosis, intracranial tumors like meningioma and glioma. Associations uh, are uh, peri peripheral nerve sheath malignancy, st uh, GI stromal tumors, hypertension, learning difficulties, as well as autism spectral disorders. Ophthalmic features are in the eyelid, uh, as I showed you earlier, plexiform neurofibromatosis involved in the upper eyelid uh, lead to characteristic S-shape lead to deformity. Orbit, orbital optic nerve glioma, schwannoma, and meningioma. Iris leash nodules, as uh, Madam uh, showed you a clear picture. Ectropian, uh, ectropian novae and mammulations. Cornea, prominent corneal nerves, cataract uh, developing mainly in the type 2 neurofibromatosis. These are the types of uh, cataract you don't need to consider about much more. Uh, glaucoma and fundus, you can see choroidal nevi, astrocytoma, choroidal hematoma, congenital hypertrophy of RPE, as well as um, myoid nerve fiber layer. This uh, uh, tuber sclerosis or uh, Bonneville disease. So these are the typical uh, dermatological features um, of the tuberous sclerosis. This is characterized by development of hematoma in multiple organs from all primary genitals. It has a triad, epilepsy, mental retardation, and adenoma sebacum. The cutaneous signs are adenoma sebacum. It is fibroangiomatous red papules around cheeks and nose. This is uh, adenoma sebacum. And then the uh, ash leaf spots, There's, those are hypopigmentous patches, usually in the uh, trunk, limbs, and the scalp. And the chagrin patches uh, over the lumbar lesion, these are diffuse thickening. Then uh, subbungal hematoma, the uh, picture C. Then the uh, skin text, it is called as molluscum fibrosa pendulum, as well as capillate spots. So neurological features include intracranial periventricular astrocytic nodules, and giant cell atrocytic hematoma, learning difficulties and seizures. Visual features are renal angiolipomas, cardiac rhabdomyosarcoma, and pulmonary relief endometriosis. Popular features include fundus astrocytoma, patchy iris hypopigmentation, and atypical iris coloboma. So, Sturt Weber syndrome, it is also called as encephalotrigeminal angiometosis. Um, first, I'll discuss. Uh, regarding Port Pinestein, it is not uh, always associated with Sturt Weber syndrome. Um, so it is also called as nevus frenius, sharply demarcated soft pink patch. As I said earlier, in contrast to the capillary hemangioma, it does not blanch with pressure. So you can see uh, the lesion, mostly located on the face, usually unilateral usually aligned with the area supplied by one or more branches of trigeminal nerve. In this style, only the um, first and second branches of thalmic and maxillary branches are affected. 
but uh, in this style and this style, all the three branches are affected in trigeminal nerve. Darkening uh, to uh, red or purple takes place with age. So with the age, the uh, color will be darkening. Uh, commonly associated with soft tissue hypertrophy, congenital malformation of vessels within superficial dermis, histopathology shows vascular spaces separated by thin fibers zipped up. As I said earlier, only 10% have associated ocular or CNS involvement, including stretch Weber syndrome and other defined syndromes. So not all the patients with Ford Feinstein are not having Street Weber syndrome. So better to, if the child is with these features, better to um, refer to the ophthalmologist as well as neurologist to exclude these syndromes. So ocular features are ipsilateral glaucoma, episcleral hemangioma, iris heterochromia, and diffuse choroidal hemangioma. So uh, this uh, treatment regarding only for the port pine stain, uh, laser such as pulse dye is effective in decreasing skin discoloration. Topical preparations such as imiquimod and uh, rapamycin along with laser, soft tissue debulking, screening for glaucoma should begin in infancy. Systemic investigation is considered in patient with lesioning lumbar region. So these regarding street Weber syndrome, it's a congenital sporadic phacomatosis. Uh, glaucoma ipsilateral to the facial hemangioma in 30% of cases. Uh, among them, 60% of patients are UOP elevation before two years of age leads to ophthalmics. So it's very important to refer the patient to ophthalmologist, pediatric ophthalmologist in very early age to identify the uh, glu um, uh, uh, glaucoma and treat. The remainder, that means uh, the remaining 40%, glaucoma developed at any time from infants to adult. So it is very important to um, follow up the patient until adulthood. The pathogenesis for the um, development of glaucoma is uncertain. It may be trabecular dysgenesis or raised epistral venous pressure. So always exclude epistral hemangioma in patient with um, straight Weber syndrome. And this is a treatment for the uh, development of uh, after developing glaucoma. Uh, usually medical treatment alone may be inadequate. So we have to go for a surgical intervention as well. Goniotomy if the patient with angle anomalies and combined trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy. And these patients are high risk of de developing choroidal effusion as well as supracoidal hemorrhage. So be careful about that. So this is my last uh, slide. Uh, this is incontinentia pigmenti. It's, a, um, it's also called as Bloch-Sussberg uh, syndrome. It's an X-link dominant one. So it is a mother to daughter transmission. So lethal in utero for boys. So nearly all affected persons are female. Uh, skin appears normal at birth. Uh, characterized by erythema and bullous rash. It's a vascular bullous rash on the trunk and extremities in first few days of life and persists for four weeks to months. So these are, these are the lesions when it get healed. When healed, lesions appear as clusters of small hyperpigmented macules in characteristic splash pain distribution. This is called splash pain distribution prominently on the trunk. Other features are microcephaly, scissors, mal malformation of teeth, hair, nails, and bone. So ocular features, this is a very uh, important association and which lead to uh, blindness of the uh, child. So it it, it is associated with proliferative retinal vasculopathy, resemble retinopathy of prematurity. At birth, incomplete peripheral retinal vasculation is there. Abnormal arteriovenous connections, microvascular abnormalities, neovascular membrane at the junction of vascular and avascular retina. So rapid progression may lead to retinal detachment and retroentricular membrane within few months of life. Uh, micro, uh, microphthalmos, cataract, glaucoma, optic atrophy, Stabismus and nystagmus may occur second to in state of retinopathy. So it is very important to sequential retinal evaluation for first one to two years of life. Uh, treatment for the avascular retina, including photoregulation or cryotherapy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajala. And uh, with that, we uh, come to the end of uh, this clinical meeting. And uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka College of Ophthalmologists uh, 
for organizing this event and providing the resource person and the expertise. And uh, this session, the material will be available as a video so that others also could be benefited as CPD material. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Suranta Pereira for his concluding remarks. Hello. Yes, uh, yes, Suranta, yes, you can. Yes, uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Indika. And uh, this is uh, one of the meetings uh, which we have organized uh, among the series of uh, meetings with the uh, clinical meetings with the other colleges. And we were uh, lucky enough to listen to a very informative series of uh, presentations, which included a case presentation, uh, lecture, and a, a MCQ and picture quiz. And on uh, behalf of the SLMA, I'd like to thank all the uh, presenters, all the lecturers. And then the, I'd like to thank the IT team, which handled the uh, program and uh, IT uh, work. And also the people who joined uh, with us, I saw the numbers around uh, initially at the one time, it was around 50 plus. Uh, that's a good number uh, considering the uh, current uh, context. And finally, uh, as uh, Professor Indik also know, which I, with the point which I discussed with him earlier, we are planning to develop a concise uh, lecture notes on uh, lectures on uh, this uh, lecture series. So I invite all uh, four uh, lecturers uh, to write, uh, I think what we thought is to limit the number, words uh, to 1,500 uh, or below, uh, you can write uh, those uh, presentations, convert it into writing and uh, send to us, SLMA. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank the president of the uh, College of uh, uh, Ophthalmologists and uh, its uh, council members. Thank you very much.